appreciate it. But welcome. We are glad to have you here this morning. If you're a visitor with us this morning, uh, we do ask if you got the uh, visitor information card, you could fill that out and uh, turn that into the welcome desk after the service. We have a gift we'd like to give you for visiting us here today. Uh, just a couple announcements. One, obviously, as you can see, Pastor Kern is uh, out of town until, I believe, gets back Friday. So he's going to be out of town for today and Wednesday night. So today you get to hear uh, the JV crew, me and Pastor Jordan, if you want to refer to us that. But we are glad to have the privilege to preach to you this morning. But Wednesday, we will have our team from West Coast Baptist College will be with us Wednesday night. All right. And do we still need host families for that? Or we... All right. Thankfully, we have all the host families for that. But please come on Wednesday night to hear the group from West Coast. Uh, and then Friday, August the 5th, will be our ladies' summer celebration. And our Lord's table will be observed that Sunday night, the 7th. And then the lantern's breakfast will be on Saturday the 13th. So just some upcoming events. Teenagers, we will have our first event since the beginning of the summer, uh, our T-shirt party on Saturday the 27th. I'll be here at the church. We'll be designing our new T-shirts uh, for the upcoming year and a new theme that we're going to have based out of Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. So there's a sign-up sheet for that on the bulletin board, as well as for uh, the ladies' summer, break, summer celebration as well. Got a couple of announcements as well for the ladies' summer celebration. If you can sign up by tonight, that would be great. Preparations are being made this week, so please sign up for that. Um, the library, the reading and listening club. It's this week and next week, and you're done. So keep it up. This is that last stretch, the last lap. You can almost see the finish line, so keep up the good work. Um, the VBS boys presentation. Last week, we saw the girls presentation. For all the VBS boys, please come tonight. If you can be in the church uh, fellowship hall by 10 minutes before the service, that way we can get all the guys ready to go, and then we'll come out. If you can, guys, make sure you wear your green T-shirt from VBS. That would be great. We want to see your T-shirts and then meet at the church about 10 minutes before. Uh, something else about choir. We were going to start choir again after summer break next week. We're going to postpone that a little bit, so stay tuned on that. We are joined us this morning to lift our voices to our Lord Jesus. 459, 459, if you'll stand, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Four hundred sixty-three. Four hundred sixty-three. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
assurance of salvation, we can say, it is well with my soul. 478, 478. singing you may be seated we get to give of our tithes and offerings to the lord during this time we're thankful that you're here this morning brother anthony why don't you come and pray for this portion of the service dear heavenly father lord again we thank you again lord for allowing us to gather today lord in your presence thank you lord for giving us a building where we can just share each other lord we share your words can be preached Lord, I pray that we take this time, we'll look at our lives, Lord, and just expose, Lord, that how important you are to us, how every day and every second, Lord, it's a gift, and it shows us your mercy, Lord. Lord, I ask you, Lord, just to pray for the pastor, Lord, just to make sure that... Um, 
his words resonate towards us, Lord, and deep in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Something special. 325. 325 will be our next song. If you stand again, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
this time, we're going to dismiss the juniors to Junior Church as we sing 328, 328, Come Every Soul, by Sin Oppressed, There's Mercy with the Lord. standing for scripture reading and prayer. All right, we'll go ahead and start off with our memory verse, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. For those of you that need to turn there, we'll go ahead and read it together once and then say it once for memory. Hopefully most of us got it down pretty well. Hopefully I don't mess it up in front of everybody. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. All right, I'll go ahead and give the reference, and we can say the reference together and say the verse. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Oh, <laughs> keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me, because he trusteth in me. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. All right. The great divide. Those who say the reference before knows to say it after. All right, um... We'll give it a whirl one last time, see if you can say it without looking down. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. 26, 3 and 4. And turn over in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Ecclesiastes few pages over. Ecclesiastes chapter number one uh, and verse number four. I'll go ahead and uh, read out loud if you all follow along silently. Ecclesiastes one, uh, four through eleven. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteneth to the place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about, 
unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we have set aside where we can come to your house and worship uh, and learn from your word. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for this local church uh, that you've given us uh, where we can serve you and grow. I pray, Lord, that you might be with Pastor Kern uh, as he's traveling, that you might give him traveling mercies. I thank you, Lord, uh, for Pastor Schoenrock, and I thank you, Lord, for him stepping up uh, to preach to us today. And I thank you, Lord, for the, um, the heart he has for you and the blessing he is to this church. I pray, Lord, that you might fill him um, with your power. The Lord, that you might calm his nerves, give him the words to say, help our hearts to be attentive. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, really quickly, before we get into the, uh, the crux of the message, one of, our, uh, one of the ladies here uh, informed me, and I know many of us have been keeping track uh, recently and, and such, but they received a text this morning from uh, Andrew uh, Stephan uh, just saying that baby Claire is just having a rough day. And being something I know that's probably on most of our minds, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Schoenrock if he could just uh, pray for Claire, and obviously you along with him can pray for her as well. Amen. Uh, it is my privilege uh, to preach with you, uh, preach to you uh, this morning as Pastor Kern's away. Uh, but as many of you are aware, uh, my my life is a little different right now. Uh, about a month ago, uh, I got married to the most wonderful woman in the world. And one of the things that you do is you uh, you go on a honeymoon. All right. So we went on a cruise. And uh, something I discovered when you go on a cruise is people tell you all the time, oh, the food, oh, the food. And oh, my word, there was a lot of food, all right? And, um, you know, the exact number, I'll keep a secret between me and my scale, but let's just say some changes need to be made in my life. Uh, so I got back. Uh, so obviously, one of the things that you expect to do in those cases is like, all right, we need to go on a diet and you need to exercise, the two dreaded words for anybody at the turn of the new year, and as I discovered, for anyone that returns home from a cruise, ex- diet and exercise. And so one of the things you can do, obviously, is you can, uh, you, can, you can go on a treadmill, whether you want to walk at an incline, you want to run on it or something like that, or you just want to walk on it while you read a book or go on your phone. But I saw, an, I saw an interesting fact, and I didn't know if it was true, and I looked it up, it actually was, about the treadmill. And that's that 200 years ago, the treadmill was invented in England as a prison, a prison rehabilitation device. It was meant to cause the incarcerated to suffer and to learn from their sweat. It was pretty much designed for torture. <laughs> All right, so pray for Pastor Tim as he begins his torture here. He's been staving it off for too long for my own well-being, but I thought that was a, a crazy, I was like, for torture? Like, they would do it to, like, you know, crush some cornmeal and stuff like that, but it, 
uh, crazy things you find out on the internet. Um, but the reason it's torturous, and the reason if any of you have ever decided to get on the kick to exercise and get in better shape, it's exhausting, you know, and it, it's tiring, and it's, that's why people don't like to do it. And the treadmill itself, obviously, you understand it's a, it's a tread that's on a circle, and all it does is just keeps going in a circle. And eventually, whether you're running on it or walking on it, you're going to get to a point when you're just, I'm tired, you're exhausted. And that's kind of what Solomon is describing here. He's talking about life in circles, the life cycle, the circle of life, you know, if you're Simba and Mufasa or something like that, uh, things come full circle, whatever it may be, with an under the sun worldview, you can easily see things as like, you know what, life is just a unrelenting machine that just keeps on ticking. I wake up, I go to work, I go to bed, I wake up, I go to work, I go to bed. And then it leads to the question that we talked about when I first started uh, the book of Ecclesiastes a couple weeks ago. Solomon is taking the case of the monotony of life and using it to say, you know what? Life is just not worth living. It adds to the vanity and the vexation of spirit. It adds to the pointlessness of life because it's just one big circle. You live, you die. Someone else takes your place. They live, they die, and someone else takes their place. Um, time moves on. Time, things never change, and it's exhausting. No one wins, nothing is new, and no one beats death. This cynical view of life, also cynical, uh, was a burden to Solomon. All right, for if life is only part of a great cycle over which we have no control, and praise the Lord, we have control over the treadmill, but if life is just a cycle of which we have no control, is life really worth living? Solomon pondered these questions as he looked at the cycle of life under the sun, and remember, looking at things under the sun is a worldview apart from God. He's not looking at it with a biblical worldview. He's looking at it from a human perspective, seeing the cycles of life, and it's just, it's not worth living. And he comes to two bleak conclusions that we're going to look at this morning, and that is that nothing changes and nothing is new. So first of all, let's look at nothing changes. We see in verse 4, he says, one generation passeth away and another cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Nothing changes. Uh, the sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose, and nothing really changes. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Nothing real changes. All the rivers run to the sea, yea, the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Nothing changes. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it, and I is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. Nothing really changes. Solomon presents the cycles of nature to prove that nothing changes. And as you look at it, you're filled with a picture that just shows life to be something that is exhausting and unfulfilling. He talks about the sun hasted to his place. The sun rises and it quickly goes back to his place so the moon can take its place just so it can rise up again. And for many of us, that describes our day to day. Is it not, oh my word, I gotta wake up Tomorrow's Monday, and I don't know if you're like this, but a lot of people are like, oh, I can't wait. I don't want to go to work tomorrow. You know, you got to get up, go to work. And some of us, as soon as we're done with work, we can't wait to go down again to our bed. We get into it as quickly as we can, and forgetting our other responsibilities we may have, just so we can get up again in the morning. The sun hasteth to its place. We hasten to our rest just so we can get up again. The wind whirleth about continually. It's restless. It never stops. Some of us are restless. Some of us feel like if we aren't doing something, we're doing something wrong, and that makes us restless. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to think about. We need to be doing something, and it's not fulfilling. Because we see, lastly, the sea is not full. No matter how much the rivers run into the sea, the sea does not overflow. All right, we're not flooded right now or anything like that. That's the picture he's painting. Life is exhausting. It's continual hustle and bustle, and at the end, you're still not satisfied. With the human perspective, that makes you begin to think that, you know what, life is not worth living. When we look around us with this perspective, we see around us tired and unfulfilled people. Solomon cites the monotony of life as his first argument to prove that life is not worth living. And because of this, because we just live in a cycle, nothing changes, we begin to see that this human perspective paints a world that there are no answers to prayer and that there are no miracles. 
for nothing can interrupt the cycle of nature. Nothing changes, then there's no answers to prayers, and then there's no real miracles that happen in life because it's just gonna, you live, you die, and someone's gonna take your place. However, we know differently. God does break into nature and do great and wonderful things. We see in the Bible alone that in the book of Joshua, he held the sun in place. We see in Exodus that he parted the Red Sea. We see during the time of Elijah that he simply stopped the rain, turned it off. And we see in his own earthly ministry that he calmed the winds and waves with but a whisper, peace be still. That's how great our God is. But of course, with the under the sun perspective, they don't, they don't see it that way. Remember, those that do not know Christ as their savior, those that are looking strictly from an under the sun point of view, a human perspective, you can't fault them for not factoring God into their worldview, all right? But that just lays the responsibility upon us to tell them the truth of God so that they can see it from a biblical worldview. See, God does hear our prayer and he does work on the behalf of his people. 1 John 5 verse 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Jeremiah 33 verse three, uh, when I was uh, in college, uh, I had a speaker come to our college, and he referred to this verse as God's phone number. Hey, you, want, you got a problem? Who, who are you going to call? 333. It's kind of like that guy you see on TV right now when he says, like, hey, 4444. Four, four, four. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You want someone who truly got your back? Call 333, and you got God. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Yeah, nothing changes, but we understand we have a God that hears our prayers and he works on the behalf of his people. See, the, the Christian, the saint, we're not simply living with a head in the clouds kind of mentality. People may think that, all right, because we have joy in our lives, because we understand, yeah, things may be wrong with the world. Yeah, things may just be, you know, laborious and just the same thing over and over. But, you know, why do you have joy? Oh, it's because you have your head in the clouds. No, no, we live in the world, obviously. We see the things that are going on. We are burdened sometimes by the things that are going on as well, but we have a higher understanding because of the man, because not man, because of the God we trust in and the God we serve. See, we may live in a world that never changes, but we serve a God who can change you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes, the world doesn't change, but our God can change you. John 3, 16, we all know it, 16 to 70 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He changes you from life, from death unto life, all right? But verse 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Now understand, those that don't know Christ as their savior, those that have this human perspective that nothing really changes, they're condemned already. They truly live the reality that you live, you die, and someone takes your place. That's it. But as a child of God, as a saint, those that know Christ as their Savior, we understand that is not the end. You live, you die, and you have eternity with our Heavenly Father. See, but God is not sent, did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We live in a world that doesn't change, but we serve a God that can change you, make you from an old creature to a new creature, save you from death unto life. And ironically, I know this to be true because God himself never changes. We live in a world that doesn't change. God can change you, but we also have to understand God doesn't change. He's a, you want the fancy word for, for it, he's immutable, all right? Uh, I tell my teens words like that all the time just so they can try to, you know, impress their parents. I don't know if they actually do that or not, but it just means he doesn't change. Hebrews 13 verse eight says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning, the love he has for the lost never changes. Meaning that the desire he has for his children to grow from a newborn child of Christ to a mature disciple-making believer, that desire he has for you never changes. I know my God can change me because I know his love for me is never going to change. And his love for me, in a human perspective, it's unfathomable. We can't comprehend it. That's how great it is. And praise the Lord, that doesn't change. No matter 
what I do wrong, no matter how far I fall back and may slip and fall and be unfaithful to him, his love for you, his desire for you to see you grow never changes. So we see when someone says nothing changes, well, that's simply because they don't know our God. Solomon's perspective, he's at the end of his life, he is for many years now been living apart from God. It's easy for him to look at the world like this and be like, you know what? Nothing changes. Life is pointless. It's not really worth living. But for those who are following the Lord, those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior, but following God, understand that not to be true. Nothing may change, but God has changed me, and it's my duty then to go forth and tell other people how he can change you as well. First, we see that nothing changes. And secondly, let's look at, he also says nothing is new. Now, we understand, yeah, we have new things in this world. As time progresses, we have technology, and a lot of things change. Uh, Even myself, I'm getting to that point now, especially working in youth ministries where I'm starting to feel old, because I'll say things to the teenagers sometimes, and they look at me like, huh? You know, like, oh, yeah, I used to play video games on Channel 3. They're like, what does that even mean? I'm like, well, you see, you have to, you have to plug in the video game to the VCR, and then I lose them there, and so forth. And then it, there's just all sorts of things that they just don't understand, because time goes on, and yeah, we get new technology, we get new things coming to the world, but what Solomon is really referring to here is that man is always searching for something new, but he's really not finding something new meaning he's not finding something that will fulfill him or satisfy him. Hence, he's always in just a endless search, and it's exhausting. Let's look at verse 8. It says, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no thing under the sun, no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new, It hath already been of old time, which was before us. It's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to bring you joy, but for a season. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Man's in search of something new. He wants something new, but everything in this world ultimately brings weariness and people long for something to distract them or deliver them. All right, and we see the the evidence of this around us all the time. This is why... Reality TV is so popular. People are searching for an escape. Sports, that's an escape, all right? And, and quite often, whether it be social media or something like that, quite often we're, we're searching for things that are really, not only are they not fulfilling, they're definitely not worth our time, all right? That's why when Russia can invade the Ukraine, more people are actually concerned with what kind of face Johnny Depp is making during a trial with his ex-wife than they are actually concerned about a war. We're looking for an escape. We're concerned with ourselves with things that are really pointless in reality, all right? That's something Solomon can uh, say is true, all right? And we're searching for something fulfilling in all the wrong places. Um, Now, not to say there's anything wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with certain shows. There's nothing wrong with enjoying sports. There's nothing wrong with enjoying those things, all right? My wife is starting to scare me right now, all right? She's getting into, uh, now there's nothing wrong with it. But she's really starting to enjoy watching these DIY videos, all right? And so she's getting into these, they're called Ikea hacks, all right, where they take Ikea furniture and they just do something, slap paint on it or put some new hardware on it, and they make it look like, oh, it's not from Ikea, and so forth. Now you may think, all right, Pastor Tim, you're scared because she's going to want you to make all these things. No, that's, that's, that's fine, all right? It's really not that hard. You see the videos, they don't seem that hard, and that, that kind of stuff excites me. What I'm really scared about is all the trips I'm going to have to take with her because she can't go by herself. All the trips I got to take. And you want to talk about life never changes? It looks like nothing ever changes in that store. It's just furniture, furniture, furniture. And it's a giant maze. There's no windows in it. But so you have no idea how much the passage of time has gone by. All right. (laughs) Amen. All right. But there's nothing wrong with those things. All right, there's nothing wrong with finding enjoyment in the things God has provided in our life because he does provide those things for us. But there is something wrong when that is the only thing we're searching or looking at to provide us real joy in our life. All right, I can make a new dresser for my wife, all right, but it's not something that's going to last for eternity, especially if I make it, all right? (laughs) You can be a sports fan and love your team forever, but they can even win the Super Bowl, which I don't think is going to happen for the Vikings, 
but it's not going to bring me true satisfaction. I, I, man's looking in all the wrong places, all right? Uh, we chase after everyone but God. We chase every time but eternity, and we chase everything but real things. See, the world provides nothing new. We look again at verse 9. It says, the things have been, it is that which shall be. All right? It's not going to, it's nothing new. And if that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new, it hath already been of old time which was before us. See, man cannot create anything new. Not, man can't create anything truly satisfying. I can create as many dressers and DIY projects, but man cannot create anything that's truly satisfying because the creature is not the creator. Only God can bring that which is truly satisfying. Only God can create new things, and he begins by making a sinner a new creature. We talked about that already. Behold, all things are become new. You are a new creature. Think of the woman at the well. He says, hey, can you draw me some water? But he tells her, hey, I can give you living water that you may never thirst again. And that caught her attention. If he just offered her, hey, let me draw the water for you, she does that every day, all right? And if we live in a human perspective, wake up, go to work, go to bed, wake up, go to work, go to bed, and it's a continuous cycle, we're never going to be satisfied. We're always going to be weary, but Christ offers something truly satisfying. Christ offers a purpose truly worth living for, that you may never thirst again. We can walk in newness of life. We can sing a new song, and one day we will enjoy a new heaven and a new earth. This is all only ever found in Jesus Christ. The biblical perspective, all right, not under the sun, above the sun, sees that while man looks at for the world for something new, something that truly satisfies, I understand that true peace and rest comes from Christ. That's really what we're searching for. That's the satisfaction man is truly searching for is peace and rest. So let's take a step back for a second. When we're looking or trying to understand how Solomon's thinking here, life is just a cycle. You're just living in a, in a cycle that's just but like the treadmill is going to become exhausting. It's going to become weary and unfulfilling, okay? And for man, if he lives with that perspective, with that worldview, it's going to feel like you're a prisoner. But thank the Lord, we understand as a child of God, we are not prisoners of this world. world. We're pilgrims. See, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, all right? And I'm not living for the things of this world. I'm not trying to be caught up in trying to, move up the, the economic ladder. I'm not caught up with trying to get this or that. I'm not caught up with what the world values. No, because I'm living for Christ. And that frees me from feeling like a prisoner in this life to understand, you know what? I'm just here to serve Christ and there's a greater uh, home awaiting me one day in heaven. We're not prisoners, we're pilgrims. We can be joyful and confident that God will meet our every need as we trust in him. Turn over to Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter 6, and uh, Jesus Christ is talking to his disciples here as they're about to begin the, the, the full part of their earthly ministry, and he's trying to encourage them and have them understand, you know what, there's going to be rough spots ahead, you know, you know what, this isn't going to be the easiest of lives, and God does not promise the easiest of lives, but you can trust in me to provide for you, all right? And we can have that same peace and rest the disciples have by trusting in Christ and casting our care upon him to provide for us. Beginning in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6, it says this, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? So he's saying, hey, we're about to go off. We're about to go into the ministry here. Don't worry about where your next meal is going to come from. Don't worry about where you're going to lay your head down to rest. And what's kind of sad is that we see here Christ is talking to his disciples about like, hey, don't worry about survival, all right? Don't worry about where you're going to get your provisions from. Trust in me, all right? Because they're going to face some hard times. And the reason I say it's sad is, and especially for Christians in America, all right, right, for people in America in general, it's not usually about, oh, I'm worried about uh, survival. I'm worried about provision. There's a lot of people that simply live for these things. They're not worried about, am I going to have a meal? They're more worried about, am I having the best meal? They're not worried about what I'm going, to, if I have something to wear, they're more worried about like, oh, what am I wearing? What is she wearing? What is he wearing? We're living 
for these temporal things that God says, I'm going to provide for you that trust in me and follow me. And we're caught up in living for him, not concerned about him, but just living for that, for our fulfillment and satisfaction. When Christ simply says here, that should not be the case. Follow me and I will provide for you. Verse 26, behold the fowls of the air, uh, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Hey, I, I care for the birds, I can care for you. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Lord, I'm trying, all right? <laughs> Some of you will catch that later. <laughs> I'm trying. And what he's trying to say there is, sometimes not only are we caught up in trying to live for the things of this world to satisfy us, sometimes we're caught up in trying to change things we have no power to change anyway. All right, so instead of focusing on that, focus on me, God says, follow me, all right? Because guess what? If you can't change that, God knows you can't change that. The Lord made me this hype for a reason. I don't know why. He knows I can't change that. So don't worry about it because I still have a purpose for you despite what you perceive to be your limitation. And sometimes we don't serve God. We don't follow God because we think, you know what? I have limitations. I have things I can't change. God's saying, don't worry about those things. I am behind you. I am your strength. Let's go as we go beyond the, the height verse here. Verse 28, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, the man who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. All right, so don't worry about that. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If Christ if God has such care for things that are very temporal, like if man's life is but a vapor, the grass, the flower, the lily, it's even shorter than that. Verse 31, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now he's using that to refer to uh, those that were not Jews, all right? But we can also picture that to be those who do not know Christ. The world is caught up with living for these things that do not truly satisfy. It should not be so for the believer. The world may think that it should not be so for you. For your heavenly Father knoweth what that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We can be joyful and confident that God will meet our every need as we trust him. We can have full peace and rest. But lastly, turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Only God can truly satisfy. Again, this is probably a very familiar passage, especially if you've been coming on Sunday nights with uh, Pastor Kern. But Matthew 11, and we're going to begin in verse 28 up to the end of the chapter. And the verse, the passage begins, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. With that human perspective, the treadmill, it's exhausting. We're weary. If you're, if, if you're a believer here this morning and you are weary and you are restless, understand God can give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is life. He, his promise is essentially peace of heart and rest of soul. As we submit to him, as we follow him, as we get underneath that yoke and follow him, he will give us peace and rest, but only if we submit and follow him. The yoke is a, an instrument in farming where you can use the power of two oxen to pretty much just double your strength and, and plow more, and, and, and that one will not begin to be uh, more exhausted and tired because he's working with the other one. All right, it, it, it attaches them together that they can move as one unit and be more powerful. All right, now the picture we see here is Christ saying, hey, take my yoke upon you. So guess who you're partnered with? Partnered with God. Who do you think's carrying more of that load? See, we become weary, we become unsatisfied because we're carrying our burdens, our loads all by ourselves. But the Bible says, Christ says, cast your cares upon me. Stop burdening yourself so much cast your cares upon me, follow me, and guess who's going to carry most of that load, if not all of it? God. But often we do the opposite. Yeah, we'll get under the yoke. Yeah, we say we're trusting God, but we want to go our own way. 
We want to follow our own path. We want to seek something else we think will satisfy us instead of following where Christ wants to lead us. Uh, growing up, we had a dog named Carmen. All right? Now, Carmen was a, a schnoodle, all right? schnauzer mixed poodle, okay? which means she wasn't a big dog. All right? Very small dog. We take her out on a walk. All right, and inevitably, if, if anybody has a dog, they understand this. If you take them on a walk, there's going to come a point when a squirrel or something else comes by or a car, and they, instead of walking with you, what are they going to do? They're going to run the other way. Now, remember, Carmen is a schnoodle, not a big dog. All right, she's not going to move me. She's not going to move my brother Chris. She's definitely not going to move my brother Mike. All right, so there comes this point when a squirrel goes by or a car, and she wants to chase after it. She runs the opposite direction, we're standing still, and you get that whole, and then she's like up on her hind feet, and she's pulled back by the leash, not because we're being mean, not because I want to torture my dog or anything like that, it's just my dog doesn't know any better. She runs against the other, runs against the way we are taking her, and it ends up putting this strain on her, and she goes, it's kind of comical in a way, all right, eventually sometimes we have to stop her or pick her up because she can't stop but want to chase that squirrel, but oftentimes, as a believer, we do that to ourselves in our own lives. We know Christ wants us to go somewhere. We know Christ is leading us in general direction. But you know what? I really want to follow after this. I really want to seek this promotion, this car, this, this that, or the other, whatever it may be that's ultimately going to fade and die, which ultimately is just part of the cycle of life that's just gonna one thing after the other. It's never gonna truly satisfy. And we're putting unnecessarily strain upon our life and stress simply because we're not submitting to God and trusting in him. Remember, only Christ can truly satisfy. And we are never going to experience that satisfaction and rest if we continually go against him, pull against the yoke, try to go in the other direction because we think we know better for our lives. Christ has a purpose for us, all right? Christ can give us the things that truly satisfy us. We cannot in going in our own way and seeking to find satisfaction in the things of this world alone. If you're living uh, life today and you find yourself to be just, I'm tired. Life is just burdensome. Life is weary. It's just exhausting. Are you living for things that really matter? Or are you living for the things of this world? Maybe that's not the case. Maybe you are trying your best. But are you trusting in God? Or are you trusting in your own strength and trying to carry that yoke all by yourself? Cast your cares upon the Lord. And if anyone is here this morning that does not know Christ as their Savior, I ask you this morning, you can. Remember, we live in a world that doesn't change, but we can tell you about a God today who can change you, who died because he wants to change you, whose love for you has never changed, and he desires to see you come to know his son as your savior. Life may be a circle. Things may never change. Nothing may ever be new, but that's simply if we eliminate God from our worldview. But praise the Lord, there is a God who wants to change us, and praise the Lord, there is a God who can make you new and give you a purpose worth living for. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this.